What are we doing for fun in Venice? Taking a gondola. Welcome to Laura McKenzie's Traveler. Hi, I'm Laura McKenzie, and welcome to Tony's Used Gondolas. No, I'm just kidding. We're in Venice, Italy, but doesn't it look exactly like what you'd expect? It's a city that's totally unique, and nowhere else will you find one that even resembles the lifestyle here. There's no cars, no traffic, making it look almost exactly as it did a couple hundred years ago. So gondolas, yep, we got them, and a lot more. This has to be one of the most beautiful cities in the world. And while Bangkok is referred to as the Venice of the East and Amsterdam is called the Venice of the North, nothing compares to the real thing. This is a city that's so romantic, so cultured, and so, well, beautiful that no other place in the world comes close. Venice has been described as a visual masterpiece, and it's often been painted as such. It's as if a virtuoso orchestrated the city as a harmonious mix of sights, sounds, and incredible sensations. There's so much to see here, and one of the best ways to soak in all the history and culture of Venice is on the water. Now, when it comes to navigating the canals, you have several options. You can hop on a water taxi, rent a boat and a driver, glide in mass on a water bus, or you can choose my favorite mode of transportation and go for the gondola. This tour will set you back about 60 euros, which is a lot more than the other options, believe me. But I can vouch that at least once, it's worth it. Chalk it up to having a unique cultural experience. The gondoliers will give you a running commentary on what you're seeing as they navigate through the canals. And did I mention all the sights you'll see? Oh, the Casanova building? Yeah, that's where he lived? Some attractions will be historical, and some you can file as just interesting to know. Where's the green line? Oh. Or better yet, what's the green line? It's a layer of algae which lines the canal walls and marks the water level at high tide. And when the water goes even higher than the line, ah, the Venetians are prepared. They only live on the second floor or up because the water comes in. You know, while I love learning about Venetian history and culture, I have to admit I adore window shopping from my gondola. The only bad part is you can't actually buy anything from the boat. But I'll be back. That's if I can get through the traffic jam. The city streets might be free from rush hour backups, but the canals are a different story. So while you're waiting for things to clear up, you have a perfect opportunity to study the different types of gondolas. If you notice, all the gondolas aren't exactly the same. At first glance, they look the same, but each one has its own carvings, its own decorations, and definitely its own gondolier. And if you're willing to pay a little more, you can be serenaded on your tour. Now that's different. No tour of Venice would be complete without a trip down the Grand Canal, the largest in Venice. This is the main drag, as they say, and has been described in the past as the finest street in the world. Unfortunately, if you're in a gondola, your entrance to this famous waterway won't match its grandeur. He comes out onto the Grand Canal and he goes, Oi! And I said, what? And he goes, that means honk honk. <laughs> Let's see, count them. Three bridges, including the famous Rialto Bridge, 15 churches, I don't know how many bell towers, and these gorgeous palazzos. I think the Grand Canal is the best place to discover the essence of Venice. It's also the place to find a lot of those other seafaring options I told you about. That's a water taxi, and that is like a big water bus. While I love making my first trip down the canal via a gondola, I must admit that it's difficult to soak in all this beauty in just one trip. I mean, look at this place, it's incredible. 
You know, for a little extra fun, plan one of these trips for right after sunset when the palazzos are all lit up. You'll get a few glimpses of the interiors before they close up for the night. Despite all this opulence and beauty, there is one funny thing about the canal. The two banks of the canal were once called De Citra and De Ultra, which translate to this side and the other side. Well, that's creative. The Grand Canal may not have inspired the city planners, but it's been the muse of artists for centuries, which makes perfect sense because it has views that are amazing. And others are just uniquely Venetian. These gondolas are sleeping. Well, even gondolas need a break. We leave the Grand Canal. Arrivederci, Grand Canal. Here's a tip. There's no disability access in Venice, and bridges all have steps. Getting around is possible, but expensive by using a boat or a water taxi. Laura McKenzie's Traveler. We'll be right back. Welcome back, and for more information on Venice, go to lauramackenzietv.com. Once you've explored the city by boat, it's time to see it from a whole new angle, on land. But there aren't any cars in Venice, so you're going to have to rely on your feet. Don't even think about wearing high heels in Venice. When I say you're going to walk a mile, that's on a slow day. You know what I did last night? I stayed up late and hemmed my pants shorter so I could wear tennis shoes with my slacks. My feet thank me today. But just because you've gotten out of the gondola, don't think that you've escaped the canals. Venice is basically a bunch of little islands separated by canals and connected by bridges. Lots of bridges. Trust me, you'll spend the day going up and down and up and down. No wheelchair access, I'm afraid. You'll have to go by boat. There is one thing you have to see and it's at the top of the Rialto Bridge. Want to see a great view of Venice? Now that's a shot. Hey, I see my gondola. The little streets around the Rialto Bridge are great for walking. Just remember, outdoor restaurants are usually on the water, shops inland. Go ahead, have a look around. Just like in Florence, the Rialto Bridge is lined with shops and souvenir stands. It overlooks the Grand Canal, the main drag, the superhighway of Venice. And just like any major boulevard in any major city, it has its own version of bus stops and taxi stands. The water bus is called the Vaporetto. To save cash, choose the number one Vaporetto. It's inexpensive and its slower pace allows you time to notice all the intricate details of the canal but make sure you're close to the front of the line. That way you're guaranteed a good spot. Water taxis are faster, more direct, and more expensive, just like the ones on land. So to save time, let's hitch a ride on a water taxi for the must-see attraction in Venice. Wow, so you get here and you say, St. Mark's Square, this is fantastic. Well, technically, this isn't it. This is the Piazzetta. St. Mark's Square, Piazza San Marco, over there. It's the big one, and trust me, you'll know it when you see it. It's the one not on the water, and believe me, it's huge, with a cathedral at one end and the rest lined with shops and cafes. And what do both squares have in common, besides the fact that they connect? Both are overrun with pigeons. The reason the square is packed with these birds is because of a centuries-old tradition. The doge used to release the pigeons in the square every Palm Sunday as a gift to the people, and the people would eat them. Well, the pigeons that survived this yearly massacre were deemed worthy of finding protection in St. Mark's domes. As the tradition continued, the protected number of pigeons in the city multiplied, increasing to this day. And now you have this. Okay, so there's like a sport here in St. Mark's Square. It's called pigeon dodging. Oh, oh, here comes one. It's hard not to get overwhelmed by a pigeon population this out of proportion and this pushy. Excuse me, like I'm trying to work here. <laughs> You'll see pigeons throughout the city, but St. Mark's is the only place where you can safely feed them without paying a hefty fine, which is probably another reason why the birds come here. Incoming. Ever seen the movie The Birds? 
Of course, the pigeons aren't the only attraction in St. Mark's Square. Well, you can't come all the way to Venice without going inside the Ducal Palace. Come on, the entrance is right over there on the canal side. Sorry, no cameras allowed. So, once you've gone through, turn back to the square because you don't want to miss St. Mark's Basilica, which is one of the oldest, most beautiful, and most visited cathedrals in Europe. This Byzantine sanctuary is over a thousand years old and houses not only some of the oldest mosaics in Europe, but it's also the resting place of St. Mark's remains. And as you say, I didn't know that. The story of how those bones got there is rather interesting because they were stolen in 828 AD by two Venetian merchants. They took the remains from his tomb in Alexandria, Egypt. And when the relic reached Venice, the Doge had St. Mark's Basilica built in celebration. So the story goes, the end. You know, St. Mark's Square has to be one of my favorite places in the world, and it's the perfect spot for an age-old pastime. The cafes on St. Mark's Square are great for people watching. And you know, if you order something, you can sit here for an hour or more, nobody rushes you. But there's good news and bad news. The good news is the tax and the service is included. The bad news is it's kind of expensive. Let's see, eight euros for a soft drink or a cup of coffee. And one thing you should know, if there's music playing, they're gonna hit you with a five euro cover charge, turning it into about a $15 cup of coffee. But I think it's worth it. You have a front row seat to the best show in town, free ticket to the toilet. I think I'm gonna be here a while. Here's a tip, taking a water taxi from the airport to your hotel is expensive and you'll be dropped at the closest dock to hire porters with hand carts. Laura McKenzie's Traveler, we'll be right back. Welcome back and for more information on Venice, go to lauramackenzietv.com. Venice is an amazing city because it looks so much like what you see in the old paintings. Just like in Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice. And in keeping with that incredible tale, I think I'm ready for a little merchant trading myself. I mean, have you seen the stores here? They only have the best. Okay, shoppers. There's two main areas to shop here in Venice. To find them, you come to St. Mark's Square. Face, the cathedral and the Doge's Palace. And in the far left-hand corner is an archway. You go through there, and that's the main shopping street. Now, for the more high-end, the Louis Vuitton, the Fendi, the Versace, the expensive stores, face the other way, directly facing away from the cathedral and the Doge's Palace. Again, far left-hand corner, you walk through that archway, and that's where you find the good stuff. American Express is down there, too, when you need more money. Well, since I'm pointed this way, I'll start with the designers, just for comparison, of course. So, what's good to buy here? Anything Italian. Leather's great, handbags, shoes. Of course, I'll buy everything. The only thing you don't want to buy are counterfeit goods. This is not the place to get designer knockoffs because Venice has recently enacted a penalty for purchasing fakes. And although I haven't met anyone who's been caught, I heard that some travelers have been fined up to 10,000 euros. Is this a tale to scare you off? Well, I don't want to try it, you know, take a hit for the team. So if you want the designer label, get the real thing. As you're walking around looking at the shops, if you can tear your eyes away from the windows, look up, that's old Venice. Ah, uh, enough of history, we're shopping today. Oh, I like those. This is shopping heaven, come on. You know, if you buy a certain amount, you can get your VAT back, your value added tax. So that's a savings, it's a discount. There is a minimum in some of the stores, so make sure that you ask for a form, the D-tax form, and you fill it out and get your money back at the airport. If designer duds aren't in your budget, even with the VAT, then follow me to the Rialto Shopping District. You know, a lot of the shops you'll discover are just souvenirs and touristy things, but you have to get something. Why? Well, because in about a year, you're going to find it in a drawer and you're going to say, oh, my trip to Venice, that was so much fun. It's a memory. 
In Venice, you won't just find your typical magnets and keychains. No, they have much more interesting souvenirs, like gondolier hats and carnival masks. Oh, yeah. Venice is a carnival any time of the year, and they've got the masks to prove it. And some of these are real works of art. But your Venice souvenirs don't have to be kitschy. They can be practical and beautiful while still representing the history and craft of Venice. Something you'll actually use and appreciate. Well, besides jewelry. So where do you find an item that has all these characteristics? I discovered the perfect place, in the glass factories on the island of Murano. The Venetians have always been known for their glass production. Their techniques and style made glass making a profitable and sought after trade in the city. In fact, the secrets of glass making became so valuable that any Venetian master of the art who was caught trying to leave the province ran the risk of losing his hands or his life. The good old days, right? In 1292, the glass factories of Venice were relocated to the island of Murano because the doge feared a fire breaking out in the city. Today, Murano is still the place to find and watch the production of well-crafted Venetian glass, which is quite something to see. Can you just sort of walk me through the process of, of making a piece? Well, first of all, the melting, which is done with silicone sand, pure virgin sand, the minerals to make the color, 24 hours, temperature is approximately 2,500 Fahrenheit, and then the material is ready to be shaped by the glass master. And then what happens? Um, it's, does he actually blow it? Uh, not always. We blow, but we also shape, so we use these two techniques. While watching the process is really fascinating, I believe in appreciating an artist with the highest compliment, considering a purchase. <laughs> That's cute. And even though they have plenty of experience shipping, I say, spring for the insurance. The hardest part is choosing what to get. Oh, oh I want this. Oh, I love this so much. And this is why Murano glass is the perfect memento from Venice. It's unique. It encapsulates the history of the city. It's beautiful. And whenever I use it, I'll remember my trip. Here's a tip. What's the best way to feel good and stay healthy when flying? Staying hydrated on a plane is a very important thing for your health. Many people worry about their hydration once they're already on the plane, and at that time it's too little too late. In order to keep yourself hydrated, you should work on this before you ever step on the plane. You should have 8 to 12 ounces of a non-caffeinated, non-alcoholic beverage before you get on to keep your body with the fluid that it needs. Alcohol and caffeine both are diuretics that make your body lose fluid and they actually work against keeping you hydrated during your flight. Laura McKenzie's Traveler will be right back. Welcome back and for more information on Venice go to lauramckenzietv.com. Okay, once you've played with the pigeons, dropped in on the doge, glided on a gondola, beheld the basilica, consumed one of the world's most expensive cups of coffee, and hit the shops, you're probably ready to settle in for the night. But first, you have to decide where to stay. Because you're going to be doing that much walking, the location of your hotel is so important. Obviously, the closer you are to St. Mark's Square, the better, but the prices are going to be higher. So, decide what's most important to you. Sightseeing or shopping? Sightseeing or shopping? Sightseeing or shopping? I'm going to have to get back to you on that one. Well, even though I love to shop, once I saw the Londra Palace Hotel, it was just too beautiful, and the service is just too friendly to pass up. Actually, it's unlike any other hotel in the world, and the first thing that sets it apart is its location. We are near St. Mark's Square, the historical center of Venice, which is a really downtown. I would say really five minutes walk to get to the, 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 to the shopping area, to get the, to the most beautiful art galleries, to go and see museums, to go and see the Basilica or any other place in Venice. Throughout its history, it's been the home of various artists, dignitaries, and celebrities. One of the most noted guests was the famous composer Tchaikovsky. 
And to commemorate this famous guest, the hotel has adorned its walls with his personal memorabilia. And now you can actually stay in his original room. Behind door number 106 is a room that's filled with photos and mementos that the Russian government gave to the Londra Palace Hotel. They definitely make the history of his room come alive. So much, in fact, it's rumored that some guests have awoken to the faint sound of music. Venice is a place that's like no other city in the world. It has its own look and its own personality. It's not only one of the most romantic cities in the world, it offers its visitors memories like they've never had before. So take my advice and don't settle for a city that says they're like Venice or they're the Venice of their country. See the real thing. Well, I hope you enjoyed seeing some of Venice with me. Be sure to join me again next time from another terrific place somewhere else around the world. From Italy, I'm Laura McKenzie. Bye-bye.